Jesus saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And here, as we near the midway point of the Epiphany season, we have two of the most famous fish stories within the Bible. For our gospel reading, that Jesus finds fishermen. <clears throat> He says, come and follow me. I'm going to use what you know how to do. I'm going to use your experience. I'm going to use your talent. I'm going to use your wisdom. You've got the tools. You've got the know-how. You're the right people in the right place at the right time. Follow me. And you won't just fish for fish. You will fish for people. And that was really what the video was about this morning as we started the service. Jesus found fishermen, and he used their skills, their abilities, their know-how to bring praise to God and to build his kingdom. God calls you where you are, who you are, with what you know how to do, and asks that you use that to bring praise to God and to build his kingdom. And maybe it's not vision. I think there's a teacher and a plumber and a construction worker and parents and grandparents, neighbors, friends. Upon the sea of your life, you are around many different schools of fish. And you know how to do stuff. You have wisdom born of experience. Skills, talents, and abilities from the oldest among us, even to the youngest. But we all know a thing or two about a thing or two, most especially within the sea in which we live and play and work. And Jesus calls to each of us, regardless of age, regardless of vocation, calls us to follow him as his disciples, then use what we know how to do. Use who we are. Use the particular sea in which we find ourselves to bring praise and honor and glory to God, to build up his kingdom and to cast nets wide so that fishes of all tribes, languages, nations might be brought to meet Jesus. Jesus. So you don't have to fish in a literal way, <coughs> but we do fish in that metaphorical manner in which we take the people the Lord has blessed us with in our lives, the circumstances in which we find ourselves, the ability, tools, and the know-how that we have in this time, in this place, and to cast a net wide. That God can be glorified by you doing a good job with what you know how to do. God can be glorified by you using your talents in such a way that shows not only Him, but the whole world. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me with this. Do you know who I have to thank for that? It's the Lord God Himself. Come meet Him. Come see Him. I cast the net out. By the way, I trick people. I cast the net out by the way I live my life with integrity, with character, with holiness, and with righteousness. I cast my net out when I seek to serve others as I'm seeking to serve Christ himself. I cast my net out so that people just sort of swim it along in my path. Not just as a fisherman, but as that plumber, or as that teacher, or as that office worker, or as that parent, grandparent, student, neighbor, friend, might find themselves in a net. A net of God's own making, but of my casting. Send it out. Send it out with my words. Praise for God. Love for you. Send it out with my actions of humility, with my actions of care 
and of devotion and faith, with actions of stewardship, with actions of service. Send it out in my own particular and unique way, with my particular and unique skills and abilities, and the particular and unique circumstances and situations I find myself in, and the particular and unique people that the Lord has placed in my life, but maybe not in yours. The ones he's placed in your life, but maybe not in mine. Cast it out. You let him <coughs> the rest, no matter who you are. There are things that you can bring to bear to praise God, to build his kingdom, to bless others, to help them meet Jesus. So cast out that net. Cast out that net. Cast out that net. Well, I said there were two fish stories this morning. The being fishers of men is the most famous fish story from the gospel then probably the most famous fish story from the Old Testament is going to come from Jonah. This is our only Jonah reading of this particular lectionary cycle's year. Why? I don't know. This is all we get. So I plan to take the opportunity and to remind us a little bit of the fish story and why I think we have it today. So... If uh, you have your Pathway Bibles or have grabbed the Black Pew Bible, because I warned you last week, didn't I sure I did. Um, we are back in the book of Jonah, which if you're in the Black Pew Bible, it's only 800, 801. That's it. Short book. Four chapters, but it doesn't even cover two pages within this particular Bible. If you have a Pathway Bible with you, it's on page 1407. But again, I think it's three pages from start to finish. This is a short, short book, and everyone knows probably something about the book of Jonah. Because it's like a children's book that we give to kids and stuff, right? Oh, Jonah up the way. Okay. But before we assume this is only a story for children, let's go back to it for a moment and give us a little bit of the context reminder. We are in the third chapter of four, and our reading... Chapter 3, verse 1 starts off with, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. The first thing we ought to know is this is not the first time. This is the second time the word of the Lord has come to Jonah. We have to skip back a few chapters to go to the beginning of the story to hear God speaking to Jonah the very first time. The first time is the part of the story we're more familiar with. Sort of. We talk about Jonah the whale or Jonah the great fish. But what gets him in there is the word of the Lord coming to Jonah that first time. Jonah, a famous prophet, I want you to go to Nineveh. These are foreigners. These are pagans. But I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach repentance. Because they're pretty awful. And I think they ought to be judged. But I want you to go preach repentance to this great and mighty foreign, pagan, nasty city. And Jonah says, here I am, Lord. Send someone else. <laughs> and God says, no. This is your job. You are my prophet. This is what you are to do. Go to this great city. Go to this wicked city. And preach repentance because judgment is coming. And Jonah says, I'm on my way. And runs as far and as fast as he can in the opposite direction. For a prophet of God, Jonah seems kind of dumb. As though he can get on a boat and escape God. As though God would stand on the seashore going, But Jonah! Ah, missed him. <laughs> Jonah tries to hide as though he were a small child hiding under a basket of laundry. And God finds him. A terrible storm in this boat. It's going to sink and they're all going to die. And Jonah knows at the very least when the jig is up. So Jonah says, I'm caught. This is all my fault. 
I know you guys are panicking. I know you think you're all gonna die. It's actually all because of me. Go ahead, toss me overboard. You'll be all right. It's not your fault. It's mine. God, you got me. That would be in chapter two. Toss them overboard. They're fine. Jonah, however, is not. So when our two famous fish stories in the gospel version of the fish story in the New Testament. The fishermen are caught by, I mean, the fish are caught by fishermen. In the Old Testament, the fishermen become the bait. And so Jonah, and he swallowed. Is he swallowed by a whale? Is he swallowed by a shark? Is he swallowed by your fish? Is he swallowed, I don't know. I don't know. There's some ambiguity here. I am not a scholar of the contextual, biological elements of Hebrew and pointing to the particular species of marine life this happens to be. He is swallowed. And yet he lives. He lives. He starts praying. God, I repent. God save me. I'm in the pit. I am in the deepest of darkness. Have mercy upon me. When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord. My prayer came to him into thy holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to thee what I have vowed I will pay for deliverance to one Lord. What I said I would do, what you told me to do, you got me. I'll do it. Please save me. And he is barfed back up onto the shore. And the children still alive. Oh, but that's a story for kids, and how could he survive? Okay, number one, I don't know the specifics, but number two, I will tell you what I do know. When Jesus says, to this wicked and perverse generation, I will not give any signs about who I am or what I am about to do. Other, what does Jesus say? The sign of joy. <clears throat> what is the sign of joy? Yes. To be in the deep darkness of death for three days and to be delivered out of it on that third day in your life. Jesus himself refers to this story as a precursor to his death, to the tomb, and to his resurrection. It's important to him. I say it's important to us. So, we have now moved on through chapter 2. We're racing through this thing. It's short. Really, really short. And now we're finally in chapter 3, where we read. Jonah finally breaks down to do the right thing what God has asked him to do. He goes into Nineveh, and he preaches repentance. But then what happens? <coughs> they repent! What? What? <laughs> They're not supposed to repent! These are the bad guys! These are the foreigners! These are the pagans! They are wicked! They deserve judgment! I mean, yeah, I did what you told me to do, but that's like this pro forma thing, right? I mean, you're supposed to say, uh, repent because your judgment is in hand, but that, I mean, it's just like, it's like checking off a checkbox. <coughs> right? I mean, come on, God! These people repent. They hear, repent, return back to the Lord, judgment is coming, and they totally repent. They call a solemn fast. They refuse food. They refuse water. They tear their clothes. And they put on scratchy garments. They take ashes and dump them over their heads. They wallow and they lay in it to show how humble they are before the Lord, and they beg his forgiveness. An entire giant city. From the most powerful ruler to the least known commoner. They throw themselves in the mercy of God. They actually repent, turn away from sin, and turn back to God. And God is merciful. So they want you to repent, and they say, you got it. And God says, good. And repent. And Nineveh is spared. And Jonah is 
up a tree. <laughs> what? What? See, we don't get this in our reads. You have to kind of finish the book. <laughs> it's super short, but we don't even get this part. We see the conclusion of chapter 3, where God spares Nineveh out of love when they repent. All of chapter 4 is Jonah flipping out. How dare you? Jonah says, don't you know how much trouble I've gone to? I have been in a whale or a fish or a shark or whatever. I am covered in barf. I walked all around the city. I have totally humiliated myself. This is my job. Hey, I'm not sure you know this, God, but the job of a prophet is to tell you bad things are coming, and then the bad things come, I get to say I told you so, and then the next person says, oh, he told them so. He's a prophet. <laughs> I told them they were going to get destroyed. They did not get destroyed. You are going to ruin my career. You're going to ruin my reputation. <laughs> and let's just be serious for a second. These guys had it coming. Come on now. I want to see some smiting. Can't you smite them at least a little? They deserve it. They totally deserve it. Foreigners, pagans, bad guys. Do it! And you won't? Are you serious? And he huffs, and he puffs, and he stomps around. <laughs> and to once again, to show the, the depths of his emotional maturity, Jonah does the equivalent of throwing himself on the ground and stopping. No, 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 no! And he says, I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. Rather than you spare them. I'll show you, God. I'm just going to lay out here in the sun until I die. And then this plant starts to grow. The Lord allows this plant to begins to branch out and leave. And it offers a canopy of shade over Jonah. And out of nowhere, Jonah, who has just been baking in the broiling hot sun, complaining about, I'm just going to stay here and die, suddenly he's protected. Cool shade begins to revive him. And he starts to think, oh, well, this is great. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I was being a little dramatic, but <laughs> now that I have the sun, things seem a lot better now. <clears throat> yeah. God sends a worm. The worm eats the bottom of the plant, and the plant begins to wilt, and the plant begins to die. As soon as it's sprung up, it begins to retract. And the shade is pulled away from Jonah, and he's left back out in the hot and barren sun again. And now this poor plant, which had sprung from nothing to shade him, has now collapsed right back into nothing, just as quickly as it came up. <clears throat> and Jonah, wise, mature, <laughs> obedient Jonah, says, you took my plant! How dare you! <laughs> so God tells Jonah, Jonah, you didn't do anything to have that plant come. I brought that plant out of nothing, and I nurtured it, and it provided for you. It blessed you, and it saved you. And now I've taken it away. You didn't earn it. You didn't make it. And yet, you're going to pitch a fit about a plant that one minute it wasn't there, and then it was, and then it's gone again, and you're going to boo-hoo-hoo and stomp your feet and cry your big tears and shake your fist about a plant. <coughs> How about just a tiny fragment of that passion? How about just a tiny crumb of that love for the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people of Nineveh who would have been destroyed just like that plant? It 
seems like you don't care for them at all. But you care for a planet. God says, I made those people. Just like I made that planet. I don't desire their destruction. I desire their repentance. Out of love, I hear your repentance. And I restore them. Love. God who made you, <coughs> who knows you, who has sustained you, does not de desire your destruction or death, but desires your restoration, Red re desires your redemption out of love, wants to bring you back from that far country and back to Him forever. It's merciful, God is loving, desires us to repent, to turn to Him. Those people in my life, man, I work with them and I know they're not the sort you want. People in my neighborhood, you have no idea. I mean, some of them are a little rough around the edges. And then there's that other lady and she used to write those passive aggressive notes when my grass got too high. You don't want to read them. What about people my family? Oh, 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 you don't know what so-and-so used to do to me. And it's not that I'm a grudge holder, but... We are not given the job to the church, but like Jonah, we are simply given the job to proclaim, to cast the net. Through our words, through our actions, through our lives, that people might be restored. They might be redeemed. They might come to know Jesus and to love him. It's not up to us to say, but I don't like them very much, and I don't want you to save them. Or how dare you? He dares to save them as he has dared to save you out of mercy. Our job, if we are to follow Jesus, is to cast that net wherever we might be. In our own particular corner of our own particular sea, with our own particular boat and our own particular net, to the particular fish that are swimming underneath us, that we would cast that net for the praise of God and for the building of His kingdom. People might know him. People might love him. People might be saved by him out of his love and his mercy. <coughs> and so this is where we are, and this is where I think those two fish stories <coughs> connect. <coughs> that every follower of Christ <coughs> is called to leave something behind, and yet to use what they've been given, what they know, and where they are, to shine forth the glory and praise of God. And it's going to act like a net when we do that. It's going to get sent out, and it's going to go underneath us, and it might even go deep, and you never know. Who or what might get pulled up from the depths because of it? In some way, somehow, the net has caught you. And so now it's our turn. Thanksgiving and praise. We have been commissioned and consecrated to use the work of our lives to praise God. To use the work of our lives to build His kingdom. To use the work of our lives so that others can see Him and know Him and love Him. We may not be mighty prophets like Jonah. I do hope we're smarter and more mature. We may not be professional fishermen. 
with tons of experience and talent, with exactly the knowledge of where to go, what to do, and how to do it, because otherwise we don't eat. But in our own lives, in our own ways, with the people the Lord has placed around us, we cast out them continually, regularly, with reckless abandon, even, because you don't know what might fall underneath that net. But I can tell you, if you don't throw a net, you shall catch <coughs> very few fish. Not for our sakes, but from his command. That's not your net. Again and again and again. It could just be very simple things. Loving service, kindness of heart, virtue of life, proclamation of praise. As we are founded in worship, it may be expressed through our evangelism and through our outreach. That's the name. That's the name. In your own sea. In your own boat. To the fish that the Lord has uniquely given you with the way you can uniquely reach them. <clears throat> that is our answer as our year continues to unfold. We follow Jesus. We do what he says. You want to be in thanksgiving for what he's done. <coughs> Simple. Let's go fishing.